This is AV Week, Episode 2, for Friday, August 12th, 2011. I am not a gesture. Ready. AV, AV Week. Performing scan. Week. Online. This is AV Week. Welcome to AV Week. This is uh, episode number two. I'm your host, Tim Albright. With us this week is Jessica Spicer. Jessica is the social media specialist for AVI SPL. You can find Jessica on Twitter at AV Jessica. Hello, Jessica. Hey, Tim. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Also with us again is George Tucker. Uh, George is the engineering engineering coordinator for World Stage. Uh, you can find George on Twitter as well at Tucker Twos. Hello, George. Hey, guys. How are you today? Good. Uh, also with me in studio is Michael Drainer. Michael is the audiovisual specialist, or audiovisual systems manager for Tech Electronics in St. Louis, Missouri. Hello, Michael. Hello, everyone. Uh, the first story up for me this week, guys, is the economy, and that, that sounds kind of weird coming from an AV show. Uh, however, kind of what I wanted to, to look at is how the economy and how the ups and downs are going to affect the industry. Um, after last week, the uh, S and P downgraded the United States' uh, credit rating to an AA plus. What happened on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday was a virtual uh, roller coaster. Uh, Monday it dropped, the Dow dropped 600 points. Tuesday it went up 400 points. Wednesday down 500 points. Thursday back up 400 points. As of this recording on Friday at noon Central Time, the Dow is up 140 points. Uh, Jessica, how is this going to affect your, your AVI SPL is, a, is an integrator. How is this going to affect the integration companies, not necessarily projects today, but projects six months and maybe a year from now? Well, I think the roller coaster um, is definitely something that, that businesses are going to be nervous about, obviously. Um, we're, we're certainly stealing ourselves for maybe um, a slightly softer third and fourth quarter because of this. And um, I'm, I definitely, I definitely think it's something that integrators need to be concerned about, um, especially those like us that have um, a lot of systems integration corporate projects. Um, as we were discussing before the call, um, I agree. I think, you know, projects that are already in the works right now should be fine, but but things that that are being booked in uh, third and fourth quarter this year, um, I'd not be surprised to see uh, projects put on hold. In, uh, in response to the concerns about the economy. George, you work for a staging company, and, and what kind of happened this week was interesting because it wasn't just localized to the U.S. You have concerns uh, over the, the French economy. You have concerns, obviously, over, over Greece, uh, not only South Korea and um, uh, the Asian markets in London. These guys are, are, are curbing or starting to curb the short selling, which they're, they're kind of concerned with. That's maybe be what's causing the ups and downs. How is this going to affect not just staging, but other stuff in the U.S. and the AV industry worldwide, maybe? Uh, you know, I mean, staging right now, we're probably going to uh, expect a bunch of meetings that we want to cover because everybody wants to talk and, you know, get their sort of uh, battle plans ready. So they're going to have a meeting. That's good for staging, right? Oh, yeah. um, but in the broader sense... If the economy continues to do what it's doing here, and it, we're sort of really, really volatile, right? I mean, it's up, it's down. It's up a couple of hundred points. It's down a couple of hundred points. My thoughts actually come towards or, or lead towards what will an integrator and more specifically a manufacturer need to do to keep its integrators busy? Uh, and to me, it's sort of what I think of immediately is, the, do you know the book The Long Tail? No. This is a guy who wrote a book about how success in business is not really about a few products. It's about developing products for multiple niche markets and making more off of smaller markets. Hmm. And I think you see this in a lot of people discussing stuff. Uh, I think A.V. Dawn actually did a, a rave blog in which she talked about the big fish, little fish, and how she's seeing much bigger integrators competing with the smaller integrators. The mom and pops are now getting a real competition from the big boys who used to ignore these little jobs. Um, my thought for a manufacturing side as well as what are you going to do to let me get that middle income, that lower income, that 
smaller job that will eventually, when the economy recovers, lead to me having a relationship and a business um, condition with these people that says, hey, I put in your gaming system. You're a real big gamer. I, I, when you were in college, we helped you put in a nice little surround sound system for your gaming. Now you're a homeowner, graduated from college. You know, you want to you wanna step up in the world. You're not going to be able to do that with just your standard set of uh, products that are for a certain high-level market. Um, and, and I see it happening everywhere. I don't know if any of you guys have seen the ads for uh, Porsche. Mm -hmm. Porsche has a series of ads out now that says zero to, not just zero to 60, but zero to four kids. Yeah. Uh, and it actually shows a mom driving up in a school bus yellow Porsche to pick up her kids and being very excited about being in a Porsche. But... That's not their standard market. No, it's not. So you're saying and if they're doing it. Go ahead. I was going to say that. So you're, so you're saying not only, you know, the the manufacturers going after the the big jobs, but but positioning themselves to be a little bit more nimble, and going after multiple small ones. Exactly. In multiple small. And markets. again, the Porsche ads mentioned special deals on only certain select cars, but they're still pretty fancy. I mean, it's a Carrera. It's all these classic Porsche cars. And the same thing, I think, is going to have to happen for a lot of manufacturers and installers going after some of the smaller jobs with an eye towards what that could be possibly become. It's going to mean more uh, customer service. It's going to mean more attention to smaller details. And those little jobs can be very annoying because you're dealing with a, an edu educating a consumer. Um, this also has a downside for a high-level, high-market-valued item or product manufacturer, you have to then worry about, is my brand going to be diminished because I'm now associated with a different economic strata that I'm selling to? You know, Porsche was, you're very wealthy, you're successful, right? This is saying, you know, you're doing okay, but you can still have this too. And you have to sort of weigh that balance of, are you going to provide them with the very best D to A's and A to D's in your system? Or is it going to be a step down that they can upgrade later? And does, is your image hurt by doing that? And that, that holds true really for the manufacturer and for the integrator who has to deliver that quality to the client and what their expectations are. You know, George, that's, it's interesting you brought that up because that's something that here in the Midwest, we've been dealing with that for some time now where the cost of sale is going through the roof for the reasons that you just mentioned, trying to mentor these customers, educate these customers and these clients on the technologies. But we as integration firms and, and the manufacturing community, we have to get better at finding that value proposition that is still a reasonable quality, but is going to meet and exceed the customer's expectations. And like you said, it's not the Cadillac of the, the D to A and A to D, but we're putting in a reasonable product. Now, what I'm going to uh, say about this is I think that the AV industry is definitely a trailing indicator to what the market is doing, and things haven't settled out yet. So I think it's a little premature to speculate on what's going to happen over the next couple of quarters or the next 12 months. Um, I think it's going to be interesting to see what happens once it settles out where we end up landing. In, in January of this year, Infocom released their – uh, economic outlook survey for the industry and and 71 percent of integrators and manufacturers said that they had their confidence level was moderate to high in the north american segment and greater than 50 percent of them said that they believe that business is going to remain stable or pick up now bearing into mind the the recent changes I think it's going to take a substantial shift in the static market condition to cause that that level of confidence to go into the negative real far. Does that make sense? So, mm. so let me see if I, if I, if I'm putting, if I can put you into my terms, cause I, I'm not an economic guy. Um, basically uh, the ups and downs of this week aren't really going to affect it all that much. What's the net result of yes. this week? Okay. Yes. yes. Because, you know, like you said, we're up 400, we're down 600, we're up 140, we're down 140, whatever the case may be. And although the markets are rushing, Right, I don't necessarily see customers putting a hard strap on their cash right away. I think they're going to wait and see what's going to happen. We're going to go ahead and fulfill the projects that are outstanding. And then the net result is going to be where we end up once the market stabilizes. Well, it, real quick, because my math is not the greatest in the world. Real quick, just looking at the math from this week, I think actually we might be up a little bit mm -hmm. from last Friday. So, you know, that, that may be... That may be valid. Real quick, George, to your point about the – back to the, the Porsche commercial. Mm. Is there benefit or is there 
um, a, a stance that a, a, a manufacturer could take that is, I'm going to say, Apple-ish, where Apple says, you know what? This is our stuff. This is how much it costs. If you want it and you can afford it, great. If you can't afford it, sorry. <laughs> but it, is, it, it, it costs what it costs. It is what it is, you know, regardless of that's, whether that's an iPhone or that's a, a, a Power Mac or that's, you know, a tablet. It costs what it costs, and it almost becomes it's, – it's somewhat status, a status symbol, but it also works too, you know. And so whether that's a, a control manufacturer or it's a switcher company, it is their benefit in economically troubled times to saying, you know what, guys, it is what it is. It costs what it costs. If you can afford it, great. You know, I'm, I'm glad you're in that economic place in, in life. And if you can't, we'll be here when you are. I, there is a validity to that statement. I agree. Uh, I also know that. During the first recession here of this of our generation, I guess uh, that happened a couple of months ago through that through that or in the last two years it was, you were reading lots of reports and hearing a lot of integrators talk about how their clients of the very high end were not putting in the very luxurious, ostentatious home theaters. They were putting in very nice media rooms. Mm-hmm. So they weren't doing the big, big grandeur thing because they wanted to not appear to be ostentatious or showing that they have more money than anybody else. And I think some of that's trickling down into how the integrators and market have to approach some of these people. Yes, you can say, I am a status symbol. I'll always be this way. But Apple's really a consumer electronic. Mm. We're talking about really high-end installs, whether it's for a museum or for somebody's home theater. You've got a whole strata of people, and a lot of that has been working on the margins where you said, this person's just stepping up into this world and wants to get that. How do we get them in the door? Do we let a competitor take them, and then that competitor can you know, upgrade them through their lifespan if they're, if they're really doing their job well? Or do we want to grab them where they are? And there's benefits to that. I mean, again, the example of the guys uh, selling audio systems to gamers. Mm-hmm. It's a very niche market, but they feel that over time, these guys, and you know, they're not selling it to niche market gamers who are going to a community college. No offense to community college. They're going after the higher level college guys, and maybe even some of those, but even some of the community college people. But you know, where's my client, and where can I catch them early? Yeah. And that's where that, um, that, that prestige comes in. So I don't think them saying, I'm never going to turn my prices down, nor am I ever going to go to that market, is going to really help anybody in the long run. They may survive, but even Apple took its lumps. Mm-hmm. They kept that, and they almost went out of business. Oh, yeah, several if, times. If you think about it, right? <laughs> several times. So you have to be willing to take your lumps in that case. Uh, there is still, I think, also, though, a benefit towards reaching out to that other market and trying to let them grow with you. Uh, clothing designers do it. You know, consumer yeah. electronics people do it. Here's the here's the basic version for your kid that they can break, and here's the version when they're an adult that they can use and it has all these cool features. Mm, that's true. That is true. Uh, speaking of our kids and gaming systems, um, this this is something that kind of caught my eye. The Microsoft uh, is kind of working. They're taking their Connect, and if you're not familiar with what Connect is, Connect is a device that allows you to turn your Xbox 360 gaming system. Uh, into a a controlless um, uh, experience where you are you, your body motions are are controlling the uh, the games. They're taking that kind of to the next level and, and into some home automation stuff, where um, they are integrating your the the the, the connect is translating your movements into commands that can control. Uh, lighting, um, shades, AV systems, and and AV equipment. And they're also using our own body's electromagnetic energy, which is kind of cool. Uh, It kind of detects the pulses of energy uh, produced by our bodies and translates that into controls that you can control a a uh, a AV system with Jessica are you uh, are you looking forward to being able to walk up in the morning and just hitting the wall and everything turning on and and happening with your with your connect um i have to say this is a little creepy for me um i find it to be very very interesting and the technology and the things that people have done with the connect i think is really cool but the idea of um the control system reading my body movements and turning things on and off accordingly. I don't know. It's a little too big brother for me, but 
but I'm interested to see um, what kinds of what kinds of things that they can take away from this. And uh, I'd be curious to read more about it for sure. Now, is it because that there's a camera involved and it's it's reading your 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 intentions almost, or is it or is it just the fact that your body now is is the controller? I think it's the camera that I think is so strange. Um, the body is the controller. I think is a very interesting concept. Um, and I've seen a little bit about that, um, not just with the Connect, but with other products. But um, the idea of having cameras all over your house and things to make this work, I'm just not sure. I'm not sure that the market is ready for something like that. But it's certainly a very cool concept. Well, and I, I think that they that they recognize that, too, because, you know, the first generation is using the Connect cameras, but the, the next generation that they're moving toward um, with the electromagnetic field actually eliminates the cameras. And so it's detecting that magnetic energy as you're moving about the house. And that is what's just downright scary to me, that it can sense where I'm at, what I'm doing, how I'm doing it at any given time. I, you know, I think it's interesting technology. It just freaks me out a little bit. George, Agreed. George, what if somebody came up with something that allowed you to think about turning on your lights? <laughs> <laughs> well, I think they've actually got that, don't they? Isn't there are those uh, games out there that let you control the, the little floating ball with uh, yeah. your your, yeah, your brain? Um, you know, the first thought I had when I when I read this, uh, aside from the fact that uh, YouTube is full of those hackers who did it with the very first versions of the Kinect coming out, who are doing the 3D modeling and all that stuff with just the the sensor, um, is that to do any gesture based control, just like when you do vo- vocal control, you have to distinguish between my intended command and an ab- arbitrary movement. So in order to do that, of course, you have to have some kind of initiation gesture, right? Yeah. So do I have to have my two fingers in the air and, and go up and down, or what do I have to do? So there's this added step that anytime I'm using just my body to do something, whether it's the camera or just the, the infrared sensors or the electromagnetic sensors, electromagnetic sensors, you have to do something. Right, and that seems just to be a little more annoying than just flipping, flipping a switch or touching a touchscreen, if you ask me. Because <laughs> then you have to end it, right? Because if you're a programmer, you know there's the ET, the STX, and the ETX, right? Yes. In most words, you have to have the start of frame, the end of frame, and that's really what you're doing with your body. And, I, and the first, the, the first thought that I had to my head was, I am not an interface; I'm a human being. <laughs> right, <Yeah>. right. <laughs> you know, I am not a gesture. See me for who I am. Well, and, um, <laughs> and my first thought was, you know, I, I don't know about anybody else, but when I first wake up in the morning, my brain's not fully functioning. <laughs> and so for me to have to remember that you're right, the two three fingers, three fingers, you know what? I, I just want to wall switch that I, I want to re- reach over and turn on the light when, and, it, and it just work. I don't want to have to remember that I have to have two fingers on the wall or, you know, stand on one, stand on one leg for it to work. So, uh, it's well, just... I have a- Oh, go ahead, go ahead Michael. Uh, it's just overcomplicating the simple. You know, something so simple, and we got to put technology on it to make it more complicated, make it harder to troubleshoot, and, and uh, another break point when, you know, the simple light switch does the job. So, Did, Didn't Samsung or somebody at CEA last year show a gestures-based remote control? I think uh, I remember seeing video of it where they had to do this. Like they, and I think even with the Kinect, I have one of the, uh, a co-worker who has a developer's program for the, for the Kinect. And, you know, you have to start off doing this thing called the cactus pose. That's its initiation uh, or, ge- you know, initial <laughs> gesture. It just seems so odd to me. Sounds like a you yoga know? pose. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and uh, maybe it'll become natural. You know, maybe we're just not in that generation that would see that as just intuitive. But it doesn't feel right to me to do that. It's novel. It's fun. Um, but, you know, the truth is I'd rather develop, uh, or pursue something like using RFID with speed and uh, location rather than a gesture. Right. Uh, yes. There's a company out there that makes RFID tags. I think they're for like the freight, for the actual freight containers. So they can tell where it's going and when it's going. Uh, you know, they don't, they're, not, uh, they're not limited to the Heisenberg principle, I guess, but you can actually tell where you're going. <laughs> and my thought about it was, in a building, when you're doing energy management, why wouldn't you have this RFID tag and a reader in the building where if it knows that I'm going at a certain pace down the hallway... All it needs to turn on are the, are the floor lights, yeah. or the runway lights. If I stop or slow down, it knows it can then turn on the lights because it knows I have an intent and a speed to going a certain place. That seems more intuitive to me than, you know, flapping my hand in the air or touching two, ten, you know, two fingers to the wall than, than doing the gesture to control something. Well, it's either that or I slow down to check the text and I don't want to run into the wall as I'm texting my, my wife. 
walking down the hall. <laughs> but then you still need the lights anyway. Yeah, well, yeah. Well, yeah. <laughs> you shouldn't text and, and walk at the same time. Uh, trust me, it's a dangerous sport. It is. <laughs> Uh, all right, next one. This one, this one, this uh, the the uh, story out of Rave uh, is Sony, the greenest AV company, and the reason they're asking the question is Sony has achieved and or exceeded the majority of the targets set out in its Green Management 2010 Midterm Environmental Plan, which basically means uh, some of it is they uh, had a 30 percent reduction in their global CO2 emissions across its business sites compared with fiscal year 2000. Um, here's the question for you guys. Is Sony the greenest AV company? And, and the reason I asked that and, and did some research is there's a lot of guys kind of doing this. Crestron's doing it. Uh, Samsung is doing it. Sanyo is doing it. Um, why Why all of a sudden would was is Sony maybe considered the, the greenest company or the greenest AV company? Michael? I'm sorry. I was tweeting something while You're you were tweeting. talking. Lovely. <laughs> He's fired. <laughs> Well, I, you know, or is this why, a silly, why are, why are, they, why are they, story? Why are they considered the greenest AV company? I think it's just, um, you know, they're getting the press right now because they've achieved and exceeded the goals that they set out for themselves. The question is, what are the goals that the competitive manufacturers have set out? Are they as uh, aggressive, more aggressive, less aggressive than what Sony has set out to do? And, um, you know, that would really be an indicator of, of whether or not they're the greenest AV company. Because I can say, yeah, I'm going to increase sales by... Two million dollars this year, but hey, I'm already doing two hundred million, so that's not that big deal to get to that level. What? So, what what does this really mean? I don't know. And part of it was, I, I like I said, I, I looked around to see what if I could find anybody else's press releases or saying, hey, we're we're green over here, and nobody really does this. I mean, there there hasn't been anybody that said we've reduced emissions by this much or that much. Most of the stuff that I found was uh, companies touting their green products and. Maybe that's kind of what I what I have found. Um, have you guys experienced anything where maybe um, a, a company has said our processes are more green rather than our products are more green? Well, it seems like to the consumers and also, you know, as integrators for consumers, um, it is great that they're trying to, you know, reduce CO2 emissions and all those things in their plants. But I think bottom line, consumers want to use products that are green in that they're going to be Energy Star approved, and I certainly haven't heard anything about Sony putting out Energy Star products, no. um, which I think is interesting. Um, from the other article, it looks like Extron is the only Energy Star AV product at this point. So mm. I think people think it's great to be green, and I think it's great to be green, of course, but if it's not going to result in a cost savings or making your product better in some way, I, I have to wonder what they're do why they're making these decisions right now, especially since they've, um, according to the other article that we were reading, have experienced losses in their LCD <laughs> market over the last eight years. Yeah. So, so really, it's not green at all, right? Oh, right. Be quiet. That was a bad <laughs> joke. <laughs> well, I mean, honestly, that's the first thing I was thinking with all of this was, you know, what's the return? I mean, you, you and I have talked about some different green initiatives mm -hmm. that, that are going on here in the in the St. Louis area. And, you know, you take you take photovolactic cells, you take um, wind turbines and you take Rojos compliance and things like that. And the return on the investment might be a 30 year ROI. Um, but the, but the investment or the, um, the, the life, the life of the device itself or the life of the is, product is, is only 20 years. Yeah. Right. So, so where's the return on that? How is that, you know, so, so we're being responsible to the environment and I, and I'm a big advocate of that. Right. But it's got to make business sense too. And so if Sony is gaining some real business, uh, advantages in pursuing their green initiatives, I say, go for it. Right, but if it's going to hurt them in the end, and as we're going to see when we get to one of these next articles yeah. <laughs> about the television, then is it really worth it at the end of the day if you can't sustain your own operation? Well, we'll just so. we'll, we'll move into that one, and that's that's the fact that Sony's looking at, and, and most analysts believe that they're not going to start, they're not going to make TVs anymore. Um, what they they've done is is over the last uh, six or eight years, they've uh, for eight I'm sorry for eight consecutive years, they've lost money in their in their. Uh, their TV line, which is just crazy to me. I, I remember a time, and part of it's part of it's the fact of, of Sony was trying to be the premier TV or one of the premier, almost like a pioneer type um, plasma and, and, and LCD manufacturer. 
and they lost their their shirts to guys like Vizio, which is ironic, and um, LG and, and and Sanyo, who were doing inexpensive LCDs that they could crank out and and sell for five or six hundred bucks a piece. I remember a time when to to buy a Sony, regardless of whether that was a camera or a three quarter inch deck or or a, a DVD player, meant. First of all, you were going to spend some money, but it also meant a quality product. And I don't know where in the last 30 years Sony lost that cachet. Because now, it, it, Sony is almost like a joke. I mean, they make the PlayStation 3, which was a horrible... They, they, they came out of the gate really, really badly. Xbox still beats them. And, and so right now, Sony has lost, at least to me, and, and George, you can, you can give me your perspective... It, it, Sony has lost that Sony edge, I guess. Indeed, I was just about to say that it's the uh, long line of uh, Sony missteps from the from what the mini disc to uh, <laughs> oh gosh, how many things can we label that they've tried to do over the last couple of years? Their, their MP3 goodness. player that was just awful. Right. <laughs> um, it, it's it's a very interesting scenario that they have just really slid down the hill they they almost have that same sort of microsoft uh, effect going on where they're a big corporation they're very influential they do come out with some really creative stuff but on the whole they always look like they're also also rands Mm -hmm. and that's a you know a major problem once you get yourself into that rut of you are just following up with what everyone else is doing you are just one of those sort of smaller line visio or any of those guys and those guys do okay with that because no one expects them to be the leader. But when they're suddenly the leader, everyone says, okay. But when you fall back, it's really hard to climb back up again, right? Um, a funny thing that I just read, I was actually looking at the uh, stock market as we were talking. And it's at 166 or almost 200, by the way. Um, <laughs> is that somebody is writing here about uh, asking Steve Jobs to buy Sony. <laughs> wow. William, William wow. Pesek labeled today saying he thinks it would be perfect because of the amalgamation of the media, the, um, the uh, actual display technology, uh, and that sort of content and mobility thing that they, he thinks they could really do really well with. Will they throw in and Google I, TV with that? Funny. I don't think so. <laughs> yeah, right. Uh, well, see, that's the thing with uh, another one of those, those, those failures of Sony. Google TV, which is not really so much Google's fault as Sony's insistence that 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 bloody remote be the same thing as their failed commander. Yeah. I mean, does right. anyone remember the commander remote? Oh, I have, unfortunately, yes. Oh, good God, that thing just <laughs> upset me. It's like nobody uses things like this. No. Um, and, and I think them also getting out of the TV thing is it's just like the installers who used to be able to make really good margins on hanging flat panels. Suddenly the flat panel people said, we need to diversify and get more more product out there, they had to start selling through the box stores. Mm -hmm. And that really destroyed companies whose main profit margin was hanging flat panels. And if you only had one thing you were doing right, you went out of business when Best Buy could do it too. Or I I personally could go to Best Buy and buy a nice flat panel and a a mount. And do it yourself. And do it yourself. I mean, you know, there's not much to it really in the end, as long as it's not a plasma that you would break just by touching. (laughs) So I think they're also in the same boat that way, that TVs are just ubiquitous. And how many TVs are really being sold? Yes, you have your big screens, but what, is a, what are a lot of the younger generation looking at it on? They're looking at it on their 17 or 21-inch laptop. Yeah. Or their, or their iPad. Or, their, or projectors. Or their iPad, yeah. Yeah, or projectors. Yeah, and, and that's – I also think that the Sony-Apple uh, thing makes sense because of both of their stance when it comes to content protection and DRM, but that's a whole other – because Sony is one of the main guys in in the HDCP and the AACSLA, but that's a whole other issue. So, uh, George mentioned it, so we'll go ahead and, and skip to to that story um, about Best Buy selling flat panels, and now Best Buy has gotten into the integration business. Jessica, we're going to start with you on this one. Um, the story I gave you guys came out of Commercial Integrator. It was it was a great couple pieces, and they've written some more, um, kind of going back and forth about. This is this you know Best Buy is going to is going to be able to compete competitively, or this is just going to be you know another thing that Best Buy offers, but there's not really anything to worry about. It, you guys are, are are integrators in in the in the Tampa you know Tampa Florida area. Should you guys be worried about about Best Buy as integrators, or is it just you know it's just another just another competitor? So I um, I certainly consider them. Um 
anybody to be competition, but whether they're going to be able to uh, take on a significant portion of the market um, is something wholly different. Um, the article mentioned several points that I thought were really good. Um, the fact that maybe they can't offer it a lower price, but their solutions are not going to be complete. Um, they're hiring a lot of very young and experienced techs, um, mostly because I can't imagine that they have the uh, payroll budget to be able to hire people who are, you know, highly skilled in the AV installation market. Um, and so what are the tech consultations going to be like? Are they really going to be able to provide real solutions um, that, that businesses are looking for? Um, I'm just, I'm not concerned about it as much, but I think it's certainly something that um, people should keep an eye on. But I'm, I'm not convinced that they're, um, they're really going to be able to do all that well in the market. I think it'll be a lot of one and done jobs. You know, you're going to maybe get a project done with them once, but you're certainly not going to call them back because of the great quality or customer service that they were able to offer. And that's what um, I think longstanding respected name integrators like AVISPL and others um, are counting on. Um, and we actually, uh, just to clarify, we do have um, offices across the country, oh, very good. Um, not just in Tampa. And so, so we do integration all across the country. Um, so we are watching it, watching it, but not not with such a concerned air. But um, I think just just to see how how they're going to do things and and how they're going to shape up. Well, and a few years ago, that they, they came out with their Magnolia series or their, or their Magnolia. Uh, I'm not quite professional, but but you know, the, their residential higher end stuff. And mm -hmm. you know, it, it was one of those things where. I can see, especially as the AV industry moves more towards IT-based solutions and IT-based infrastructure, I, I can see them creating a problem, maybe not for, for, for larger firms, um, but certainly making a run at, you know, and, and giving, you know, you know more locally-based, uh, smaller, you know, one, one office uh, institutions, giving them a run for their money because, you know what, these, these kids are, or, you know, kids, but they're 25, 26 years old. But these guys understand IT, and right now they understand IT. I think better than most AV professionals. <laughs> I, yeah, I, agreed. Hallelujah! I was about to say that. Yep, there's some of letting go here. Um, some things I think Best Buy will actually be able to take over. Mm -hmm. um, I know when Best Buy did the Geek Squad here in the the East Coast, I have a couple of friends who actually ran franchise IT companies. You know, do outsourced IT guys. And they were completely overwhelmed by the Geek Squad. Right. Even mm -hmm. with the quality being an issue, they would look at it and say the savings ratio is what they'll be fine with. And then they'll call these, these little guys in to say, well, they, they couldn't do this part of it, so we need your help here. But <laughs> as you well know, a lot of the profits margin is in the hardware. Mm -hmm. So you're not making a heck of a lot on labor. You just can't. And the hardware is where your margin is. And if you're not selling the, the hardware, you have to be dedicated to just being the labor and that's hard to maintain as a small business. Um, I, again, like you said, there's certain let, let, letting go, the flat panels, that a lot of these kids, you know, you know, your kids know how to set up a router in the house. Something that, you know, a couple of years ago, no one really knew how to do except IT pro trained professionals. Yeah. Um, but I also think there's an advantage here. Now, as we spoke earlier about going after some of the, um, the gaming guys in college, I, I have a strong feeling here that DIY can be your friend to the integrator. If you have the right market people, and they're not the DIY people who are putting in X10, although that may be a market for somebody, um, some of the people who are wanting to put in, there's what the smart home catalog people, I don't know if you're familiar with this, uh -oh. who do, you know, sell a whole bunch of stuff. They, I think their product line is called Insteon. It's a sort of Z-Wave based system. Um, there might be a market for a mid-sized AV company or installer to, to approach them maybe have some kind of assistance for a DIY folk who then can then upgrade later. Uh, again, it's all about that relationship and that long tail of being able to provide some niche services at a profit, but that doesn't get over, you know, doesn't max out your, uh, your labor to a, to a negative effect. Again, it's, it's, a, it's a very careful situation, but there is something there that you can learn from Best Buy and say, okay, we can probably approach some of their market and take some of it back. Well, here's a question to anybody, any of the three of you, because I'm not involved in, in doing this 
why couldn't, to George's point about the, the profit being in, in the hardware and not the labor, why couldn't you restructure yourself to where the profit is in the labor, where you go, you know what, you're, you're going to get the flat panel, or you're going to get, let's say that that, um, that Best Buy starts carrying Crestron or Extron or, or higher-end switchers. Why couldn't you, you say to the customer, you know what, go ahead, you, I can't touch you when it comes to this piece of hardware. Um, but it, it, once you get it, I will I'll, we'll gladly install it for you. I will gladly help you service it. Why couldn't then you, you restructure yourself where the profit is then in the, in the labor, in the installation, and in, and in the service of it? You know, we've started to investigate this road. Um, we've been looking at it for about a year now. And, and maybe, Jessica, you could speak to this on some level as well. Um, I find that we realize our greatest profit margins in the labor anymore, especially with commoditized items such as displays, projectors, things that you can buy anytime, anywhere. Um, our, our margins are in the labor. It's the specialized products where our margins live in the product. And that's the, the things that are restricted dealerships, your Crestrons, your Extrons, your control systems, your higher end video switchers. Um, I, it's, I, I think it's, um, it's going to be interesting to see how big of an impact Best Buy actually makes here. I don't think it's going to be all that significant, to be honest with you, because personally, we leave a lot of these smaller opportunities on the table as a professional AV integration firm. I see them going after the smaller projects that are, are less significant to us. They're not return customers. Like George said, they're a one-off customer. And I kind of drop back to when Best Buy entered the, the what they're, they're calling the professional sound arena. We do a substantial amount of business in pro audio, and Best Buy started opening up pro audio shops. You know, they're selling JBL speakers and Electra Voice and mixers and uh, products from Allen & Heath and Soundcraft and Behringer. They're not a threat to us, not in the world that we're living in. But back to George's point earlier about, you know, in, in the economy that we're in, taking care of these smaller I – mean, I, I, I guess I don't understand it and, and – um, business to me, to me, business is business, Jessica. And you get, you know, you have an opportunity, and as long as you can make money on it, wouldn't you go after it? Agreed. Yes, but um, a lot of times the smaller projects are more focused on the bottom line cost, and um, often less interested in the services provided and the mm -hmm. services included. Um, as Michael was saying, I agree. Um, services are becoming a bigger and bigger part of our um, industry and, and for us at ABISPL, um, a bigger part of our profit margins at this point. Um, not just the service and taking care of things, you know, as we're installing them and um, offering our professional expertise, but also um, follow-up services we offer. Um, for example, for video conferencing, um, we have a bridging service that people can subscribe to and um, so then, you know, all they have to do is call an operator and we can coordinate the entire call for them. Or we have help, you know, 24 hour a day help desk support oh, wow. for um, customers who buy into that. And, you know, a lot of times the bigger customers um, are interested in making these kind of purchases where the, the smaller the smaller projects, they just don't have that kind of budget. And so, um, you know, we have been doing some some bid work and things like that with the economy, you know, slightly slowed down. But um but the kind of projects I think that most integrators are interested in are the design build mm -hmm. oh, yeah. more so because they're, they're more area for profit. And um, I don't I don't see Best Buy ever moving in into that real sector based on the model that they're um, they're working out of right now. Yeah, I don't think you're so, going to find a high level of geek squad guys that are CTS certified. Pulling but up but what if they are, though? Right. I mean, that's the thing. What, what if what what if they are? What what if from the top down, Best Buy says, you know what? Here, here's another level because there are some of those Geek Squad guys who who are who are who are, who are Microsoft certified and and I don't know if they're Cisco, Cisco certified, but but a lot of them are Microsoft certified. What if they say from the top down, you know what? Here's a business that we can get into, and here are the certifications for said business. Um, what if they say, you know what? If, to, after six months, if, you, if, if to be on the Geek Squad. You have to go and you have to get your CTS. What if they are CTS certified? Well, I, you know, I think for them to go down that road, they're going to have to reanalyze their business model. You know, what they work off of is a low margin, high volume model. 
And in order to support that type of staff, you know, fully equipped technicians with all the required test gear. You know, if you're still dealing with analog systems, you got oscopes, you got the, the, the HDMI signal generators, you've got all the different components that you're going to have to equip these guys with to be able to support these products and to be able to deploy them properly. And, and how deep are they going to go? We all know that AV is an extremely, extremely broad set of skills. And most integrators can handle the majority of those sectors from video conferencing to digital signage to AV presentations room to, to live sound reinforcement. I don't think you're going to find those skill sets in a staff, and, and I'm not degrading them because of their youth because I was there once too. Yep. But when I was 25 years old, I did not have the skill sets to be able to support and to deploy projects across that entire scope and the entire breadth of, of market. No, you didn't. I knew you were, when you were 25. No, I was quite I was quite a dumb little chap at then. <laughs> so I have a question people with quickly. that skill set. What's that, Jessica? Oh, I'm sorry. And people with those skill sets, are they gonna go to Best Buy? How much are those geek squad guys really making? You know? Right. I would think that they would want to go to an integrator where they could make significantly more money. Yeah. So Well, and it's all about I, the value proposition. You know, you were you were speaking to that just a moment ago. The the company that's looking for a one off sale, it doesn't matter if it's Best Buy or B and H photo or Sweetwater Online. It doesn't matter. They're gonna go out, they're gonna buy the product yes. cheap and they're gonna find some know it all that come in and do the installation. But people who find value in the integrator are going to continue to come to the integrator for their products and services. I have a question related to that, and especially, uh, Michael, you said that you leave some of those on the table, some of the smaller jobs. Mm -hmm. um, as we enter some kind of recovery, there's going to be a lot of startups. But those startups are not going to be willing to pay for a conferencing system that's the, you know, the, top of the, the top of the line. So they may start off with looking for some kind of off-the-shelf system with support from, a, from a, a crew. That could be Best Buy, although, and like I said, I agree, in the commercial world, I don't think they have much opportunity to really make a dent. But they could with startups. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm a startup company. I need a projector. I need, uh, you know, a teleconferencing system. And where do I do and how do I get it? What, you know, where can I do that budget? Now, if that startup's successful, you may have a customer for life as they grow and they move into bigger digs and, you know, go from three employees to a thousand. Um, how, where do you delineate between this could be a potential customer or do I leave it to the best buys to take, take that on? You know, that's a really good question. And that's actually a question that my sales staff has brought to me a number of times. And we spend a tremendous amount of time uh, working on our qualification procedure. How do, we, how do we qualify a prospect and determine, hey, is this company going to be someone that, that we're going to be able to build a long-term relationship with? Or is this a one-off sale? And I think that's something that every integrator has to take a serious look at. Because if you pursue every little opportunity, your cost of sale is going to be so high that you're never going to realize a profit. Um, you look at, at uh, an integration firm in the Midwest that's, you know, pulling, and, and I'm just speaking hypothetically here, let's say they're a $5 million a year company, $6 million a year company, and their average system sale is in the neighborhood of $50,000. It's not advantageous for them to chase opportunities that are sitting down in the sub $5,000 range, <clears throat> excuse me, unless it's a qualified customer who they, they strategically believe is going to be with them for the long haul. Does that answer your question? Yeah, pretty much. I just I thought it would be a nice one to sort of discuss. So. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely it is. And, it, and it's a very valid point. And, and, you know, it's a conversation that, that I've had in my own head a number of times. You know, do we develop a strategy that, that goes after that sub-10, sub-$5,000 range um, and, and just kind of deal in that market where what I call the trunk slammers are living? Mm. Um, and, and if that's the case, then you have to go to more of a volume model, low margin, high volume sales. Well, if you can't sustain those high volumes, then you're never going to profit down there, and you're strictly doing it from a customer service standpoint. And if that's the it, case, then you're providing a value to the customer that you're going to nurture them and bring them up to your other systems and more advanced systems down the road. So that's where that qualification it, comes in. Right. Is it worth an idea to say that I'm going to incorporate an entirely separate part of my business that is protected from the rest of the business to do that kind of thing, or is it just not really tenable? In our particular case, no. Mm. In, you know, I, I'm not of the size that that we can sustain that kind of of uh, 
I, I don't have the resources to throw at it to get it off the ground. Let's put it that way. When you right, start right. when you start talking about box sales, over the counter sales, uh, catalog orders, and things like that, um, you know, there's an amount of overhead that has to go into that because I got to have dedicated resources sitting at the phone ready to answer that call. I got to have people that can respond right now. They can't wait 24 hours to get back to a customer. Um, you know, most integration firms and, and AVISPL obviously is a very large. Uh, national company, Tech Electronics, whom I work with, is, is a fairly large regional company. Um, they don't have uh, resources just sitting at the desk waiting to take an order. And and tell me if I'm if I'm wrong there, Jessica, because you guys might. I know we don't. Um, our guys are out. They're meeting with customers. They're building designs. And our turnaround time is still what I consider reasonable to get back to a customer, but it's not at the level that the the trunk slammer is going to be able to respond to someone that's in that sub 5,000 range. Right. Actually, um, we do have um, a a, a dedicated inside sales team. I knew you were going to say Um, that. (laughs) As soon as I said it. We do. We do. But, but, you know, we're, we're the biggest. Right. You know, you are, we're, I think like eight times larger than our next larger competitor or next largest competitor. Excuse Mm. me. Um, So, you know, that's one of the luxuries of being a large company, but, but we are out there, you know, competing with, with you guys on things like, like the large projects. But, um, yeah, we do have a, a small dedicated sales team that just deals with box sales. And, and that's, and that's um, the, that's the difference between a, a large national company like AVISPL, mm-hmm. like Best Buy, right? Mm-hmm. Versus, right. versus the regional midsize integrator like Tech Electronics. But you look at the majority of audio and video integrators, they sit down mm-hmm. in that sub that sub two thousand sub four th- or sub two million sub four million range. They're not doing the the millions of dollars in sales. They can't dedicate those type of resources, and they're not going to be able to compete in that market. Hmm. Agreed. Agreed. Good talk. Um, this year at Infocom uh, two thousand eleven, I f- finally saw a, uh, a use. For the 3D technology, um, I mm-hmm. will I will not mince any words. I think 3D technology is a gimmick. I think it is a flash in the pan. <laughs> um, it reminds me of sitting in front of the television with a green and red pair of glasses, watching the uh, creature from the Black Lagoon. So let's start there with my thoughts about 3D. However, um, I saw for the first time a use for it. Um, there was a, the DLP had a booth. And there was a, a gentleman there who was an educator, and it was not fast action. It was not gimmicks. It wasn't things coming out at you and, you know, the, the, the whipped cream pie coming at your face. It was slow. <laughs> it, was purpose, it was purposeful, and it was educational. You, they, they took you through some blood vessels and, and showed you uh, bacteria and showed you, you know, 3D modeling of, 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 of different cell structures. It was incredible but again it was slow and on purpose uh this week um nec launched a 850 dollar and i I put there a sub thousand dollar because in the world of education sub thousand dollar projectors for some reason that's that's kind of a a sweet spot there it is a 850 dollar 3d projector it's 3000 lumens um they say nec says that in in economy mode it'll go up to 5000 hours on the lamp life Here's the question for you guys. Is this sub thousand dollar three D projector going to help three D get into not just education, uh K through twelve and, and secondary education, but will it help it get other places? Because right now the feeling that I've gotten at least is that three D is kind of struggling and other people are kind of passing it by and saying, Oh, look over here, here's four K and here's here's eight K. Um is is this going to give three D some legs or is it just kind of yeah, it's it's a cheap 3D projector. Um, I'd love to jump in on this one. Um, I think it's great that they've come out with an eight hundred fifty dollars 3D projector. But my question is, is it an HD? I don't think so. And my concern there is, well, what's it going to look like? Yeah. I think um, the medical use, like you were saying, for education, it could be a great projector for schools. And it, you know, it is a really good price point for a projector, but I don't think for the home market, for the consumer market, people are really going to go for this because if I'm getting a 3D projector for my home, I want it to be an HD. And also if I'm going to be watching things, you know, in 2D rather than 3D on this projector, if it's not an HD, what's it going to look like? 
Yeah, exactly, and and especially, I mean, I don't, I don't, and I don't deal with, much with with houses, um, but th- that's kind of where you know. <laughs> here's the weird thing: I get the sense, and from advertising and things that, that things that of that nature, I get the sense that content providers are pushing 3D for the homes more than display manufacturers. Am I am, am I wrong in that, or am I, is that just I'm, I'm weird and I'm in love field here on that? Because the the content providers, I mean, for crying out loud, Disney is re releasing um, was it the Lion King just so they can do it on 3D. These guys are are, are cranking out, and I, I, I'm sure for their ho- in, in their hopes to to make some more money um, on the 3D stuff. But I, I don't see a lot of whether that's Sony and and and, and or Sanyo or LG. The, the flat panel display manufacturers or even projector guys for the homes pushing 3D as much as they're pushing it more for commercial. I'm personally... Have, oh, go ahead, George. I'm sorry. I have to agree. I, I think it really is being... The impetus here is from the content people because the content people have said, okay, we had beta, we had VHS, we had DVD, we had Blu-ray, which is stalling. Where's our next slush of money coming from that is a format change it's not streaming because streaming's there but they're hesitant on it uh so i think they really are looking for this big bang you know revenue who's going to buy the disney discs (laughs) for their kids (laughs) in 3d (laughs) and you know i agree with you i i was waiting for you to ask me you know george 3d and i'm just gonna go hate it (laughs) okay george george 3d hate it Uh, george george 3d Hate it. <laughs> um, Let's go around the table. For, Anybody else? <laughs> for movies, Bye. I get it. Big, big movie theater. Got it. And maybe 20 years or 10 years from now, 3D may have some implication in the home or a place for it. It just doesn't seem right to me. It just doesn't feel right. Uh, you know. Yeah, I, I've got to say, you know, my market's not driving it. You know, cause the, at the end of the day, the consumer drives the market. And... I haven't had a single request for 3D projection or 3D display technology outside of Mr. Albright sitting right here. And that's for a very specific medical training application. So it's, it's niches. It's niches where content's being produced, and it's, it's for the theater. I'm not seeing it anywhere else. For a museum install, I could see it. Yes, that absolutely. Would be a great absolutely. Effect. That would be great. But that's really a movie, yeah. But it's a special application. I don't see it in the day-to-day classroom. I don't see it in your typical conference room, in your lecture hall. I, it's just, it's not, it's not a technology I think is here to stay. Well, and, and it, special installations and stuff like that, I mean, you can create technologies for special installations. 20 years ago, when, when I went to Disney World for the very first time, 20 years ago, okay, they had the Muppet movie in 3D. Mm-hmm. I went back this past uh, winter and took my kids. They had the exact same movie. <laughs> and I still liked it. I still loved it. But again, it was the same movie. It was the same technology that they had 20 years ago. So why 3D. do I... Yeah. I was going to say, 3D is the new quad. <laughs> <laughs> it is, it, the, the Stereo wasn't good enough, right? Quadraphonic <laughs> sound. <laughs> All right, guys. One last story, and then we'll we'll let you we'll cut you loose. Uh, this this also comes from a commercial integrator. Uh, did Energy Star kill Green AV? Uh, it's an interesting question, and here's kind of what the thing is. Um, Energy Star was their 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 qualifications for <laughs> for Energy Star was wasn't exactly um, consumer reports level. Um, uh, of of, <laughs> of testing, I, I guess the best way to put this. Basically, they were they were taking the AV company's word for it. Um, and right now, and to Jessica's point earlier, I think Extron is the only company that that is Energy Star uh, rated, and, and, and it's AV company. I mean, you know, I guess we could we could pull in Sony and, and we can pull in some other people, but let's talk about strict AV stuff here. You know, the 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 two Trons and some AMX and stuff like that. Um, is I mean I don't I don't feel like AV green AV is dead George do you I mean this is just a bump in the road and we'll we'll kind of we'll iron out these pieces I don't know if it's dead but there is some lackluster appeal to it right now especially from the integration side I would suppose uh, I the biggest thing I think of when I hear Energy Star beyond saying oh my refrigerator is going to be you know taking less power mm-hmm. when it comes to <laughs> AV. What I think about is the complications programmers have in controlling Energy Star devices. Yes. Mm-hmm. Because 
it turns itself off. And once it turns itself off, you can't turn it on. You have to have a special command to get it. And if it's not listening to that command, it turns off its listening. Because that's part of how it's getting its high energy star compliance is it turned off the listen on the port. It seems counterintuitive. Uh, you know, if I'm going to have a, an energy monitoring system, it should be able to tell me the TV's off. But if it's not listening to respond to me, I'm not, I don't know if it's off or not. Is there a way then to, and again, it has to take some kind of electricity to say, you know, this small, <laughs> this small, this small milli, 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 milli watt is going to be listening to some kind of command. I mean, I, I, I don't know. You do it. You do it like they did with E did, where you power it from the, from the control side. You know, you think about a display. You can hook a display up. It doesn't have to have power. It's powered from the source device to get the E did chip up and running inside the display so why couldn't we do the same thing with a with our control systems in controlling devices it's powered from the control processor mm, that, that, that is valid right i just don't think anybody's gone down that road yet jessica is green av dead i think no and i think the energy star thing is not significant um I don't see people asking for energy star products Mm-mm. people i think who are looking for green av are looking for bigger things than buying an Energy Star approved product. They're looking for control systems, um, like Michael was discussing. And you know, if you get a, a control system set up the right way, it can be extremely energy efficient. And I think that is a lot more effective than trying to buy products that are specifically tagged Energy Star. Um, I think the concern with Green AV being dead is. People aren't asking for it. And, you know, if your customer's not asking for it and not specifying it, then lots of times it gets overlooked in in writing bids and proposals because it is a little more expensive to program things like that up front. And um, for us, you know, we're just trying to educate our consumers um, right at the beginning of the process. Like, hey, you are going to be paying a little more up front, but the return on investment, you know, will be not too far of a turnaround for you. And you know, all these other nice things like your lamps are going to last longer if they're automatically turning off because of your control system and things. Well, let me ask you a question. Is it, is it then a, Linda would love this, is, is this then a marketing term then? Is it a marketing failure? Because uh, these, these in, in a lot of these specs, it's like, you know, what they want to save money or they're, or they're trying to go for lead points. Is it a marketing problem mm-hmm. where they don't know that they're asking for green AV, but they kind of are? Yes, and I think the term Green AV is thrown around very loosely to mean a lot of different things. But um, in the end, it's really, I think about energy savings and energy efficiency, or that's what people are more interested in right now than, you know, are the products, are the products themselves manufactured in a green way? I don't think people, most businesses are as concerned about that right now. So it really is. Right. Oh, go ahead, George. I was just going to say, I think Jessica's right. I mean, what they're looking for is the big return. It's the lighting. It's the heating. It's the mm-hmm. cooling that shows the biggest return. And that's what they're looking at, not Absolutely. whether a device is Energy Star in, its, in and of itself. So it's, like I said earlier, it truly is green AV. Mm-hmm. Oh, jeez. Exactly. <laughs> that's my bad joke again. It's I'm so sorry. Bad. I couldn't resist it, you know? Yes, you no, no, but you're absolutely right. Nobody, nobody is asking, is it certified? No. Is it going to save me money? Yes. Yeah, that's but, all they care about. And that's the bottom yeah. line for them. Honestly, that's all I care about at this stage. Yeah. Okay. Doke. Well, um, go ahead, Jessica. Oh, no. I was just going to point out, um, you know, the the way that we're growing towards per- potentially getting lead credits for AV projects. Um, I think once things like video conferencing and control systems are recognized, um by the USGBC and we do get lead points for those. I think then it'll be more important um, and maybe asked for by customers or at least by, you know, architecture firms and things that we're working with on projects. But until then, I think the bottom line is money. Yeah. Yeah. You're, you're absolutely right. And you know, this past Infocom, I sat in the, um, the green AV symposium um, with Scott Walker and uh, Joseph, um, Oh, what is his last name? Barcodio, Bar- Barchio, the vice president of uh, the standardization at Infocom. 
Um, mm-hmm. I'm probably butchering his name and I apologize if he hears this, <laughs> but you know, they really are making some great strides from Infocom standpoint to gain adoption from the green building council and, uh, the AIA and to promote green AV and why it's important. And so I, I'm, I'm looking forward to where we're going to go in the coming years, um, as far as being able to measure and recognize the contribution that, considering energy management in our AV system brings to the overall end user experience as far as their, their dollars and cents are concerned. Definitely. All right, guys, that's all the time we have for AV week. Uh, thank you very much. Jessica Spicer has been here. Jessica is the social media specialist for AVI SPL. You can check her out on Twitter at AV Jessica. Uh, Michael Drainer from tech electronics has been here. You can check him out on Twitter at Michael Drainer, uh, M I C H A E L Drainer. And, uh, George Tucker, he is the engineering, engineering coordinator for world stage. You can check out, uh, George at Tucker twos on Twitter. Uh, I am Tim Albright. Uh, you can check me out if you'd like uh, TD Tim David Albright, A L B R I G H T. And also if you have any questions, comments, or just want to get your voice heard on AV Week, you can call our voicemail. It is 219-23-AV-TV1. 219-232-8881. That is all the time we have for AV Week.